Showcasing local talent, professionals, and everyday people making Salt Lake City what it is today. It's time for another episode of the I Am Salt Lake podcast. Welcome to episode 181 of the I Am Salt Lake podcast. I am your host. My name is Chris Hollifield. Thank you so much for checking out the podcast, for giving it a listen, for checking it out. I know there's a, a lot of first-time listeners for this episode, a lot of you that maybe have never checked this podcast out. So I highly recommend you to go to the website, IamSaltLake.com, dig through the back catalog. I've talked to a r- lot of really cool people here in Salt Lake City, having them share their story, find out what they're doing to make the city a better place and making uh, Salt Lake City a place that I know I can be proud to call home. Hey, listen, this episode, I had the opportunity to partner with CenturyLink, spend three days doing good deeds here in Salt Lake City, doing some really cool stuff, meeting some really rad individuals. Like I said, I've been doing this podcast for three years, and I've never had such an awesome opportunity as I have had with those three days uh, recently here, a few days ago, partnering with CenturyLink, doing some good deeds here in Salt Lake City spreading some love and uh, getting some smiling faces as uh, we do it. So on this episode, uh, there's going to be a lot of different interviews. There are going to be little snippets of interviews. I'm going to piece them all together. I'm going to play them here. Uh, But we're going to be chatting with uh, some of the folks over at Edison Elementary here in Salt Lake City and find out how uh, Internet has helped their classrooms, helped their students, and how it helps the city in general. We're going to be chatting with Jeff Edwards over at the Utah EDC. We're going to be chatting with uh, Brian. He's a tennis director at Coach Mike's Tennis Center right in uh, downtown Salt Lake City at Liberty Park. We're going to chat with uh, Jaden at Boba Shack. We're going to have his conversation here shortly. We're going to uh, chat with Jeanette at Utah Food Bank. We're going to chat with the uh, folks over at Sugar House Barbecue. We're going to chat with Celeste at the Road Home, and uh, we're going to have a little snippet of a chance that I had to talk to uh, Governor Herbert, the governor of Utah here. Never in a million years would I have ever thought I would have had the opportunity to uh, shake his hand and uh, chat with him. But uh, CenturyLink and and this opportunity uh, helped me do that. And uh, it was a really cool opportunity. I'm going to be playing that here in just a second. Again, all the show notes, I am slash 181. I'm going to try to put pictures there. I've been, I've been trying to get a lot up online on uh, Facebook and Twitters and Instagram and all that stuff, but uh, make sure to check it out at I am slash 181. All the show notes, I'm going to try to get all the links for all these businesses. They've been really rad. I've had, had an awesome time. And uh, the folks at CenturyLink, uh, you guys were all awesome, and it was it was just a really fun experience. So hopefully this podcast portrays it a little bit. Hopefully you guys kind of get an idea on how much fun it was and uh, just all the cool stuff that we did here in Salt Lake City. Uh, with that being said, let's let's get into the the conversations that I had with the folks at Edison Elementary here in Salt Lake City, and uh, yeah, we'll just kind of go on from there. So we're at Edison Elementary. Mm-hmm. Who are we chatting with? If you just want to say your name. I'm and... Laurie Lacey, and I'm the principal here at Edison Elementary. And I'm Tiffany Hall. I'm the district's professional development supervisor. Awesome. Thank you so much for uh, taking a few minutes and uh, chatting with me. Uh, we're here with CenturyLink uh, talking about gig internet and kind of finding out. I kind of want to find out your thoughts on uh, bringing fast internet for children to use. Do you feel... How, how do you feel it benefits uh, their learning process uh, in the way that they learn? Well, in a, in a variety of ways. I mean, just the, the fact that we're able to incorporate technology into the uh, teaching and learning and the ability that the technology affords students to uh, gather information, to produce information, to get feedback from teachers, all of those things are very exciting. Um, being able to do it with the faster speed means that there is an awful, awful lot less delay Um, And that feedback that is given is more complete and maybe more important than all, it affords every student in the building the opportunity to interact with that technology as opposed to, uh, with a slower speed, having one class who's able to connect and not having connectivity elsewhere in the school. So it's made a big difference in the consistent use of technology for all of the good things that it can bring to students. 
Anything you want to add on to that? I just really am excited about the opportunity that we're going to have to have all of our teachers using technology, as Lori's just just described. Um, you know, often we've had to use technology at slower speeds with teachers modeling and showing students what they could do. Now we can really make sure that students are hands-on and they can do these things. And so it's an exciting opportunity for us to make sure that all of our teachers and all of our students have world-class skills yeah. in using technology. Absolutely. Do you find that kids are more excited to come to school and learn with having you know, access to the Internet? And, I mean, especially fast Internet, fast uh, gig Internet. Do you find it makes the learning process more fun? Definitely makes it more fun and and actually I think makes it more fulfilling for students as well. It's not just the fact that they're able to click a button and see bright lights and and do those sorts of things, but computer-assisted instruction programs have become so prevalent and they're getting so much better. So giving those kids the opportunity to to really come to understand um, through the, the programs that we're able to use. Um, one of our math programs, for example, there, there are no words and no instructions, but it's about students developing conceptual understanding of what's going on, and that's not possible on a large scale without the speed of the internet that we have coming into the building. Um, all, that's rewarding for students to figure something out. That, that's the best pat on the back they could ever have. They know that they did that themselves. They know that they figured it out, and they'll know how to apply it. So that makes it very exciting. In addition, for a teacher to have students to be able to click on a question and give their answer and get instant feedback from a teacher. It's not about taking a quiz home anymore and correcting it. It's about using that time to carefully construct the experiences that we give kids and knowing that we can instantly see who has it, see who doesn't have it, get that feedback, and never have to stop the learning process. And kids are excited about that because what kids hate more than anything in school is being bored. Absolutely. I think that's why most kids, uh, they just get discouraged, you know, and they, they're they bored and they don't want to learn anymore, but this makes it exciting and uh, keeps them coming. Do you, how, how, you might have mentioned, how long have you been uh, here at Edison? Oh dear, uh, half a year. <laughs> okay, so, so, so yeah. fairly new. Yeah, fairly it's a new, new position for me. But I had the opportunity while working at the district office to supervise what was going on at the school. So i um, familiar with what they're doing, the reforms they've implemented, and it, it's part of a community that I feel very welcome in. Yeah, absolutely. Um, do you find that kids are almost teaching you or the, the you know the, the teachers even how to use a lot of this? It's like, it's like they're born with these skills yeah. to use the yeah. Internet. Yeah. And it's almost discouraging sometimes as an adult. It, uh, is, it is discouraging as an adult. I mean, you do definitely feel like a Luddite in every sense of the word when you see a seven-year-old just making hay with the technology. But what is amazing and why you can't ever feel too bad is seeing what kids really do understand, looking at knowledge in a different way and observing what they're able to do, the way they're able to manipulate information there, the way they're able to problem solve that actually comes alive with that technology and, and their access to the technology that um, is, you can't feel bad because it's the most rewarding thing an educator could ever see. It's quite remarkable. It's interesting to think about students and, you know, what you said about students coming ready to use the technology with us. It's not as if they're, they're born with an inherent knowledge that we were just not born with because we were born too early. I think what it is is they're born with an inherent acceptance that technology is part of their world and that they're going to be using it in everything that they do. But that doesn't mean that that in a school or in a district, we can neglect teaching them how to use it appropriately. They still need to have the skills. They still need to use the technology. They need to know how to sort through information and be discerning users of that information and be able to um, access things appropriately and, and be efficient as they use that. And that's another thing that is so fantastic about what's happening at Edison and at schools throughout Salt Lake District is that we're really trying to make sure that all of our students are on the side of the digital divide that will enable them to be effective and, and um, what's the word I want? Professional users of this yeah. technology. You know, that, that yes, they're not afraid of it. They want to use it. They see it as a part of their world, as, as what they're inheriting in the world. But we've got to make sure that they know how to use it well or we, we haven't prepared them to go out into the... Well, and it'll create the next leaders and, yeah, and uh, teachers. Yeah. I mean, right here in Salt Lake City, that's pretty cool. Mm -hmm. I mean, to think about um, 
the way you know the way things are shifting with the internet and mm-hmm. and especially with the faster internet and uh, it kind of gives me goosebumps you know right here right here <laughs> in Salt Lake City I mean it's yeah. it's really cool it's really cool yeah. anything else you want to add really quick you know I just kind of wanted to get your your uh, feedback on it or, or your thought process on uh, you know how why it's important for education to have it really you know education is about as as Tiffany said it's about gaining new information, new knowledge, and incorporating that into the world that that we're living in today, being able to use that for good, being able to uh, be excited about the learning and to continue learning as as they progress. And the fact that that this internet um, and, and using it with other technologies really engages students with that process, and it's a process they're going to be engaging in throughout their lives. So it's an amazing opportunity to begin right now in elementary school, giving them that skill, capitalizing on the fact that they're not afraid of it and that we can really enrich their worlds in, in ways that we didn't even think of when I was in school. It's, it is amazing. I mean, <laughs> I wish I would have had this 20 years oh, ago, no, 30 don't years ago. All. Can you imagine? Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, we're just so lucky in this district. We have a board that supports uh, our moving forward with technology and, and a, a district and a, a amazing teachers who are willing to step out and, and learn new things and integrate this. I mean, this is a difficult thing for a teacher to say, okay, I, I've taught this way for 10 years and now I'm going to teach in a whole new way. You know, that takes a lot of strength. Um, mm-hmm. And we have we have wonderful teachers here and uh, the support of our parents as we kind of go out on this this new limb right. of the 21st right. century to teach well, these kids. And support of the community in the larger sense. So much of our technology is made possible through uh, programs where donors in the community can choose what they're going to support and the the capacity of teachers to secure donors to bring that technology into the classroom and to really strengthen the teaching and enhance the learning opportunities. It's all of Salt Lake. It's the community, it's the board, it's the superintendency, it's the teachers, it's the administrators, in the building really coming together and recognizing just how very important this is. We're recording um, at Edison Elementary here in Salt Lake City uh, with Bob and Kobe. Uh, Why don't you guys kind of, uh, why don't don't you share first what your role is here at Edison Elementary? Okay, so I'm I'm actually with the Chariot Group. So we help to install the smart board into Kobe's classroom. And we're also doing the providing training on how to use that smart board more effectively in your classroom and with student devices. Okay, I, what, I'm not familiar with the Chariot Group. What uh, what is the Chariot Group uh, for so those we do, listening that might not be familiar? Yeah, so Chariot Group we do um, we do conference room technology in like business uh, conference rooms. We work with higher ed as well as K through 12. Put it installing smart boards and other student uh, educational technology. Excellent. And Kobe, what what uh, what is your role here then at Edison? I am a fifth grade teacher here at Edison Elementary. Well, you have your hands full, I'm sure. Oh, I sure do. <laughs> How long have you been here at Edison? Um, I have been here. This will be my third year this coming school year. So you've probably seen uh, a lot of changes throughout the last couple of years, with uh, especially now with CenturyLink Gig coming to uh, the school. Absolutely. We have seen the technology in our school increase. I'd say it probably even doubled in the last year or so with um, smart board technology as well as just internet access everywhere in the school. We have netbook carts and laptops and multiple computer labs. So it's really just everywhere. Why do you feel that internet, and Bob, feel free to jump in on this as well, actually, internet benefits children by being in the school what are what are your thoughts on how, how do you feel that benefits uh children i think the biggest thing is easier access to information and it enables teachers to better better interact with those students she mentioned netbooks and laptops for the students being able to interact with those students through the technology the internet makes that more capable so she's able to create a quiz and deliver that quiz to the students and that's all going through the internet so that higher speed internet makes it much more enabled for that to work effectively 
And assessment is such a huge part of what we do, and um, we want to show that our students have learned a ton of stuff over the course of the school year. And if they're really comfortable with the internet and computers and showing what they know using that technology, then on the end of the school year tests, they are able to do that and, um, you know, and, and feel really comfortable doing that. Because I, I know how it was for me. I didn't have the internet in schools, as I'm sure <laughs> neither one of you did as well. I mean, kids now, I mean, they're probably teaching you guys how to use the internet and, and how to work with it. Tell me, Bob, a little bit about the, the smart board. Uh, I saw you using it. Mm -hmm. um, how does it work? What, what exactly is it? So the smart board basically creates a, a touch interface to interact with your computer and using the smart notebook software allows the teachers to create interactive activities up on the board to enable whole class learning or small group learning where they can interact with that content and it really gives them a, a, a way to interact digitally in a way that's much more natural. Yeah, I, I'll put some, uh, some pictures. I took a few pictures of it. I'll put it up on the website as well so people listening can kind of see what it is. It's it's kind of like just a giant tablet almost. I mean, is there really a whole lot of difference between that and a tablet? or Not really at the, its core. I mean, yeah. it, basically the software enables you to, it enables the teachers to make better lessons and make that content. So whereas a tablet, you're finding something that some programmer designed, the teacher has a lot more flexibility to create something that works with her teaching style and her student's learning style. Anything else you guys want to want to add uh, during this portion, I guess, of the the recording? I just have to say that any kind, anytime you can uh, bring in technology or the internet, kids are so engaged. They love it. They're excited to learn. And really, that's what it's all about, is making sure that they're excited to learn, because then they learn it really well. Yeah, absolutely. Actually, one more question. I, I'm curious, what is the feedback from parents? Well, I, I know a lot of parents who um, like to use the internet to communicate with teachers. They like to use the internet to check in on what their um, their child is doing at school each day. So for them to be able to do that um, makes that communication really easy between home and school. The other thing I notice is parents want to see that the money being spent on technology is being well used. And so that's one thing was we engage that technology better. We've got the smart boards with the internet. Utilizing those together it means we're going to get a lot more out of that technology and really emphasize and enhance student learning. And so the outcomes are much, much better. All right, after Edison Elementary, we went to uh, meet up with Jeff Edwards. He's the CEO of Utah EDC right in downtown Salt Lake City, right on Main Street. You guys have seen the building. It's 21 floors up. Heck of a view of the valley. I've, I've posted a couple of them on Instagram, so make sure you're uh, following me, Chris Hollifield on Instagram. Posted a couple of those pictures up there. Uh, make sure to check it out because, I mean, this guy had a heck of a view in his office. And I had a really great time chatting with him, getting to know him. Hopefully I'll be able to bring him on a future episode of uh, I Am Salt Lake and I'll be able to pick his brain a little bit more and get to know him a little bit better. But uh, for now, here's the conversation that I had with Jeff Edwards from Utah EDC. Okay, so I'm, I'm here with uh, Jeff Edwards at EDCU. Uh, 21st floor, right on Main Street here in downtown Salt Lake City. Beautiful view out your windows. I'm, uh, I'm a little jealous of your office space. <laughs> I mean, yeah. I, I don't know how you got so lucky. Well, uh, we're fortunate in that we've got great support. Um, we are a nonprofit set up years ago to be uh, part of the, uh, you know, to, be the, to have this mission around economic development. And one of the, the five founding companies was Rocky Mountain Power, who owns this space, and they actually donate this to us as an in-kind contribution. So well, that's nice of them. Yeah, it's very nice. So why don't you tell me a little bit about how, how long have you even been around? So uh, EDC Utah was started in 1987. Uh, it was started by a, a group of business leaders and the local governments uh, along the Wasatch Front who really had the idea of saying um, there's room out there for a non-government economic development organization. And uh, from that, the, the focus was, let's just focus on creating new jobs, new capital investment in the state. And it just kind of took off from there. And here we are now, uh, 28 years later, uh, and we've had a, this very successful uh, organization and all the things that we're trying to do around it. Cool. And, uh, I mean, I'm here today. We were chatting uh, with CenturyLink and Gig Internet, and, and I want to get into uh, kind of, you know, how... how you know, a company like yours benefits, obviously, from having 
uh, fast internet, but I kind of like to just find out even a little bit about you for just a second, if that's sure. okay. Kind of, you grew up here in Salt Lake, or where did you grow up? Yeah, I'm a native Salt Laker. Uh, I grew up out in Holiday. Um, spent uh, most of my education in in, in chemistry and uh, technical subjects. I uh, worked in an aerospace company for many years in uh, rocket propulsion and composite structures and things like that in engineering. Uh, went off and did a couple of startups in the computer business and uh, ended up in economic development about 15 years ago. So Where did you go do the startups? Here in Utah or out of state? Did one here in Salt Lake and another one in, in the Bay Area in the middle of the dot-com era. Okay, uh, so quite a while ago. Yeah, and unfortunately we turned into a dot-bomb. So, we, uh, <laughs> so it was time to go home and came back to Utah and uh, got involved in economic well, development. Well, and you found your way back to uh, Salt Lake City and uh, now you're part of uh, this wonderful nonprofit. How, let's talk about internet, the fast mm-hmm. internet, the gig internet that I'm uh, working with, with uh, CenturyLink today, uh, partnered up with them to uh, find out, you know, how it's helped business. Um, how has having fast internet helped your, your organization? Well, it's helped us directly by being able to deliver um, information to our clients in a, in a more timely way. Um, uh, our, our job focuses around companies that are looking for potential new sites all across the United States. And so they'll, many times we'll get a detailed list of specifications to say, um, you know, we're con- let's just pick an example. We're a manufacturer. Uh, we're considering setting up a new plant somewhere in the western United States. We're going to look in the 10 western states. <coughs> Here's a list of all the stuff we need. We need this much land. We need water. We need power. We need freeway access. We need this many workers. All that kind of stuff, and there's many, many, many layers to those questions. And so, our job is to create a response for the whole state. And we query, you know, communities from Logan to St. George, and say, do you have a site that would meet these requirements? So we assemble all that information into one big response. And sometimes it's a huge document. There's maps and videos and and uh, data tables and all kinds of stuff that's in that. Uh, you know, in the in the old days. We used to send off a FedEx package full of stuff, and we'd have binders full of information that we'd send off to clients. But that expectation has completely changed now. Everyone wants information electronically, and oh, by the way, they want it right now. Yeah. So we package these things together, put them into files, and then if we can ship these great big data files to our customers, that makes us look, number one, helps us re- be responsive, number one, but number two, sends the message to say, hey, those guys in Utah uh, are, are on the cutting edge. They, they're able to do what we want, and they, they are able, they're doing it in the right way. And it, yeah, it puts us right up there yeah. next to every other city yeah, absolutely. and every other uh, business yeah. and uh, keeps Salt Lake City on top. Yeah. You know, I always, I always like to kind of chat with people that I, that I usually bring on the show, kind of what are a few, like say somebody was visiting Salt Lake. What is something that that uh, you would say you have to check this out? You know, like I get a lot of people that listen to the podcast; they're moving to Salt Lake. Mm-hmm. They're they're here to maybe check it out for the first time. What is one or two things that uh, Jeff would say? Go check this out. You know, uh, a lot of what we deal with are the um, impressions that people have about Utah and about Salt Lake City for, from before they come here. So, what they read in the New York Times, or you know, what they hear in other places. And so, there's lots of Sometimes lots of uh, uh, misinformation or myths, if you will, that they have to overcome. So I'd recommend someone who's new to Salt Lake to say, go find out what's happening in, in the entertainment scene and in the, in the nightlife scene. Uh, Salt Lake doesn't have the national reputation of being a great nightlife place, mm-hmm. but there's a lot going on and there's a little, tons of things happening out here. And so there's, uh, there's plenty of people to be guides to help, help you find that. We were looking out the window on 2nd South and noticing the beer bar yeah. and the impact that's had in downtown and what a great place that's turned into be. That, a very unexpected thing for most people who would come to Salt Lake and say, gee, I'm not even sure I can get a drink here, and yet there's this great little spot down there that's turned into a real hub for nightlife. So so it takes a little bit of a guide, I think, for people to see that. And once they're here and they see it themselves and go experience a you know fine dining with a, a great wine list or a little place like the beer bar, uh, it, it helps dispel a lot of myths about Salt Lake, which I think is really healthy for us as, yeah. a, as a community. What about a favorite eating spot? You know, we have so many great restaurants oh, popping yeah. up here, uh, local restaurants uh, especially. Yeah. Where do, you, where do you like to get a bite to eat? You know, one of my favorite places is Maza on oh, 9th my and Oh, gosh, 9th. I love that place. What a great spot yeah. that is. And again, kind of yeah. an unexpected thing. I mean, you know, what would you expect to find in Salt Lake? Middle Eastern cuisine probably wouldn't be on the list, but what a great place that is! It's you know amazing food, great sir, great location. The Ninth and Ninth neighborhood, right there, uh, you know, feels like a lot of places in Seattle or in 
and even in San Francisco, some of those great little neighborhoods that are there too. So kind of an unexpected spot in Salt Lake City. Yeah. One last question. Sure. What motivates you? What keeps you going? You know, I, I made a conscious decision to come and do this. Um, I grew up here when I graduated from college in the 70s. Uh, I graduated in science. Uh, if I wanted to work in defense or in mining, there were opportunities. But if I wanted to do something else, I had to, I had to leave. And a lot of my friends uh, graduated and other things, and they left to go to New York or to California or something else like that to find the kind of jobs they want. And uh, one of the things that I realized in economic development was that if I – was here and was successful at doing it, we could create jobs on a lot of different industries now that, so that when my kids graduated from college, they'd have other choices that I didn't have. That we have the, and, and what's happened is exactly that. Utah's a much more diverse place from the economic point of view. There's you know, uh, software and financial services with Goldman Sachs. And I mean, who would have ever thought that you'd have a company like Goldman here uh, with the, those high-powered finance jobs that are right here in Salt Lake City? So. It's that economic diversification. That's what I th- just love to see about the state, that there are so many more opportunities now than when I was out there. It's, it's, it's a great place to be. The city is blowing me away every day. Yeah, it's I mean, pretty it, cool. It really is cool to see the it's growth cool. here. How can people find out more about your organization? Is there a website? There or is. Or? We have the, our, our website is edcutah.org, okay. and we've got a ton of data on there. Everybody's welcome to use that. If you're having a conversation with somebody about what's going on in Utah, you can probably find it on our website about, you know, labor rates or industries and major employers and all kinds of geeky economic data that's on there, but it's all available for anybody to use. And if you can't find it, ping one of our research guys and we can help you find what you're looking for. So Sounds great, Jeff. Okay. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Been awesome chatting with Likewise, you. Likewise, thanks. Thank you so much. Thanks. All right, that pretty much did it for day one. The next morning, woke up really early, met up with Mason, met up with the green gig car, and uh, we sped off to uh, Liberty Park for Coach Mike's Tennis uh, Academy right there at Liberty Park where we delivered and donated 1,000 tennis balls. The kids were nuts about it. I mean, they just went crazy and tackled poor Mason. But it was really fun to uh, see their smiling faces. After we dropped them off, I had a couple minutes to uh, chat with Brian Marchant. He is the tennis director over there at Coach Mike's Tennis Academy. Got to find out a little bit more about him and uh, find out more about him as a person and, and just a little, you know, it was just a little conversation and and uh, kind of find out what's going on with, uh, with the uh, tennis that they have at Liberty Park. So uh, here's the conversation that I had with him. Hopefully you guys are enjoying this podcast. I, I really had a great time uh, putting it together. Uh, we're at Coach, it's Coach Mike's uh, Tennis Academy Correct. at Liberty Park uh, right here in Salt Lake City uh, where we just donated 1,000 tennis balls. And uh, why, don't, why don't you uh, g- give me your name again? What's your name? So my name is Brian Marchant, and I'm the tennis director at uh, Coach Mike's Liberty Park. And, uh, you know, the, the 1,000 balls donation is, is really neat to have just because, I mean, first of all, that's just a lot of balls, right? I mean, that's, you know, we can use those for a, wh- a long time, and the kids are going to love them, and it, it really helps us out. I mean, we're, we're, uh, we're a public facility, and so, you know, we're not... You know, we, we, we welcome donations and they really help. You know, we're not, you know, getting a lot of like membership fees and club fees. So, you know, we, we can use all the help we can get. So it really does help the program and, and help stabilize things and, and, and help us grow. So we really appreciate it. How long have you been here uh, with the academy? So I've been with Coach Max Tennis Academy since I was 14 years old. 14 wow. years, actually. So over 13 years. Um, we've been at uh, Liberty Park for just about over a year now. Um, so I came down here over a year and helped start the program down here and we've been able to grow quite a bit uh, it's been really fun to see the progress and see the programs grow and so we're just excited to, to keep doing things and be involved with the community and and we're grateful for you guys help so so you were you mentioned this is you first year here you've been here for a year where were you before here in Salt so Lake City? so I was at coach Mike Stennis Academy uh, up on Oak Hills up on close to foothill there and then um, coach Mike acquired Liberty Park as well. It's okay. through a through a, a concessionaire's license through the city. So, Coach Mike's is at two facilities now. So, how many kids uh, take advantage of uh, the academy here? Oh, we've got you know we've got we've got over a hundred kids. You know, from three years old up to eighteen years old. We've um, total amount of kids that play. When we get we've get we get hundreds. So it's 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 a full service facility. We, we're able to to teach all ages and abilities. So it's 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 great. How can uh, people listening, you know, obviously a lot are going to be from Salt Lake City listening to uh, the podcast right now. How can people 
get involved, find out more about it? Do you have a website, Facebook? Absolutely. We've got a website. We've got we've got a Facebook account. Uh, if you just go to Coach Mike's Tennis Academy. Um, dot com that you can find you know you can find us get all the information we need we have classes for all ages and abilities we have adult workouts we have classes for beginners who have never play, picked up a racket before we have classes for you know advanced players we have leagues we have tournaments I mean we do it all so um, you're gonna also come come into the come into the park and come into the tennis facility we have all the information you, you need to there as well so awesome and I'll try to get those links on the uh, podcast web, uh, website as well. For people listening, do you think you're ever too old to learn to play tennis? (laughs) You know, a lot of people ask me that, and my first answer is always, absolutely not. You can can play the rest of your life. That is what is so great about the sport, is you could be 100 years old, and you can still play it and still have a ton of fun with it. So that, that is what we try to let people know is... You can, it's never too late to learn, never too late to get going on it. So Awesome. One last question, completely random. I always ask this people on the show. What's one favorite thing about Salt Lake City or, or a couple favorite things? Not, not, doesn't even have to do anything with tennis, but what, uh, what is something that you love about Salt Lake City? You know, I just I just love the people here. Okay. You know, the people here are just, you know, we've got a good diverse culture, but we've also just great, nice people, you know, giving people. It's, it's, it's just... There's a sense of community here that I really love, and uh, you know I grew up in Salt Lake. Um, grew up about ten minutes ten minutes away from Lily Park, and uh, it's just there's a lot of camaraderie here, and just love getting to build relationships with people here, and hope to stay. Awesome! Thank you so much for chatting, and, and uh, maybe we'll talk down the road. You know, awesome! Thanks right. for having me. You bet. Appreciate it. All right. After we wrapped it up at uh, Liberty Park, we got in the car. We got in the gig uh, Green Camaro, sped off to City Creek to meet up with Jaden from the Boba Shack as he was preparing a thousand smoothies where we were going to pass them out to the uh, folks in downtown Salt Lake City. I was able to uh, pull him away and I said, hey, listen, Jaden, I I just want to, I'm putting together this podcast. I want to chat with you for a little bit. I kind of, you know, just give me a couple minutes. I I just want to find out your story and find out about this uh, cool trailer that you put together and uh, the smoothies that you're going to be serving. And uh, so he said, okay, I can give you a couple minutes. But I promised him. I said, "Listen, Jaden, I'll bring you. I'll bring you on another episode. Don't worry. This isn't. This isn't the only time uh, that I'm going to chat with you." And he, so he was excited about that. But uh, again, all the links: imsaltlake.com/slash181. It's where you can uh, find out more about all the folks that I've been talking to, as well as uh, Jaden from Boba Shack. And uh, so make sure to connect with him. And, and next time he's in Utah County or Salt Lake or you see uh, his trailer, make sure to uh, grab a smoothie. Uh, let him know that uh, you heard him on the Here for Good uh, CenturyLink uh, podcast on I Am Salt Lake. And uh, check it out. So uh, anyway, here's Jaden from uh, Boba Shack. So I'm talking with Jaden Tuttle, owner of uh, Boba Shack at City Creek Center. A uh, few minutes right before we're going to pass out 1,000 free smoothies. Um, we're with CenturyLink uh, at City Creek today from 11 to 2. This will be up, obviously, m- after that. But tell me about uh, Boba Shack. I mean, how long have you been around? So we've been around since just February of this year. So, so pretty new. Pretty new. Um, so I started it. I started building it about uh, a year from now, a year f- from April. Okay. I started working on it. It took me about eight months. I got an old trailer. Completely gutted it, restored it, knew everything, plumbing, lighting, electricity, and just built it for a kitchen for this purpose. So, yeah, it took about eight or nine months to build, and then we opened up officially in February. Have you done food trucks in the past at all, or is this kind of your first food-type uh, camper, truck, whatever you first, want? First time. I've actually never done anything in the food business before. Yeah. I've always kind of had a like entrepreneurial, like, you know, a side of you motivation yeah, yeah 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 and i've done small businesses in the past um but this is the first one dealing with food okay now where are, are you more in utah county or are you in salt lake right now we're in utah county uh uh-huh. working on getting uh permits for salt lake county okay okay so how can uh, people find out more about you like what's the best way for people to find out about you where you're going to be at in the future the best way would be to go on instagram or facebook or twitter we post most stuff on instagram just at Boba Shack, one word. Uh, we post where we are each day, um, different events, different dinners, lunches, and then of course, we're open to any kind of caterings for birthdays, weddings, and s- private events like this. 
really quick, and again, I know you got to get back, but smoothies. You do more than smoothies. You you all kinds of food then? Or? Just smoothies. Okay, so um, just just smoothies. So it's the the boba in the smoothies. Um, other names are like bubble tea. These ones don't have tea, but they're the smoothie form of the bubble drink. As a person, what motivates you to do something like this? I mean, this this takes a special type of person to create their own business. Most most people, oh, okay, just give me a nine to five job. And what what motivates you to do this? I don't want a nine to five job. <laughs> that's that's my biggest motivation. I've I've always tried to get out of the system that ev- that's the pattern that everyone does. Not that it's it's bad. It works for some people, but for me, it's it's hard to stick with a job that's that's the same every day. I like being in different places, interacting with different people, and being a business owner is the greatest thing. It's such a a, a rewarding feeling. Who do you have in the in the uh, trailer with you today uh, making smoothies? Let's. Uh, so I've got my my wife Lauren. And then <laughs> just, my, just say hello for uh, the listeners. Hi everyone. <laughs> And then who else is in I've the trailer? I've got my two younger sisters, Olivia. Hi. <laughs> and Patia. Hey. Awesome. Well, I just wanted to get a little recording. I'd love to. Uh, I'd love to chat a little bit more with you uh, another time. I'll be in touch with you. I'd love to do a whole episode on uh, on what you have going on. So. Okay. And I'll put pictures up of the trailer at IamSaltLake.com. And uh, check them out. I mean, seriously, I'm, I'm excited to try a smoothie today. Well, I appreciate you uh, taking the time to talk. That's Excellent. Great. Thank you. Thank you. All right. After we wrap that up, uh, 1,000 smoothies. It was great to see all the smiling faces. I mean, who doesn't like a free smoothie? Who doesn't like uh, a smoothie with some of the little boba balls in it? Anyway, uh, this, next, this next conversation I'm going to be playing is with Jeanette at the Utah Food Bank. I was really excited to uh, to be able to go to the Utah Food Bank and, and donate a thousand items uh, to them, as I, I knew it would it would really help them out and really help out the state of Utah. I was really excited that Jeanette was willing to uh, chat with me for a few minutes, kind of share a little bit more about the Utah Food Bank. So I'm going to play that conversation now. Again, links are at imsaltlake.com/slash181. Feel free to uh, reach out to Utah Food Bank, connect with them on Facebook or Twitter. And uh, anyway, so yeah, here's that conversation with Jeanette at Utah Food Bank. Okay, we're at the Utah Food Bank with Jeanette. Uh, We're with uh, CenturyLink. We just dropped off 1,000 cans uh, donated here to the Utah Food Bank. Jeanette, what is your title with the Utah Food Bank? I'm the Chief Development Officer. And how long have you uh, been been here? Yeah, I've been on the staff for almost six years, but I've been involved with the food bank since 1993. Wow, so for quite a while. Mm -hmm. um, When... Some, a place like CenturyLink donates a thousand cans of food. Does something like that? I mean, how does that help an organization like the Utah Food Bank? You know, the Utah Food Bank, being an emergency food assistance program, means that we are here to help your family when you're in crisis. It can be um, loss of a job. It can be uh, health issues. There's many things that throws family into that scenario. Um, you can go to a pantry, any pantry across the state. You can go usually once a month. We'll give you enough product for about a seven to nine day window that helps you get through that month and gets to the start of your new budget. So recognize what comes in, goes out, pantries will place orders, but whatever we have, we distribute, and we try to help families as nutritiously as we can, but a product of some kind is better than no food at all. About how many families would you say you help a month, roughly? You know, unfortunately, we don't work in a world of families. We work in pounds. Okay. So here at the Utah Food Bank last year, we distributed 39 million pounds of food to the state of Utah. That comes out to about 31 million meals. And that's all over the state of the Utah. The entire state of Utah. Wow. So how can uh, people listening, how can they get involved if they want to? Because you do more than cans of food here, right? You do clothing or no? No. No, just cans of food. Just strictly food. Food products. So it can be um, anything that you utilize in your home, we help with. So it could be a cleaning product. It could be pet food. It could be hygiene items. But mainly we focus on non-perishable foods that you could prepare for your family. This time of the year, we see a lot of fresh produce. People who have an abundance in their garden share it here or at the other pantries. We distribute the produce. But normally, it's a canned item that will be a high-protein, so peanut butter, tuna fish, beef stew, canned fruits and vegetables. Then we like kid-friendly food, things that have a pop-top, box meals like macaroni and cheese. Anything you would buy for your family, the Utah Food Bank needs to distribute to other families. 
And can they drop it off here? Is there a, a donation um, location here at where we're at right now? So the Utah Food Bank is situated um, here in the center of the city. We're at 3150 South, 900 West. Uh, we have an east side of our building that's a dock for individuals to pull up and make those donations. Or if you live in a neighborhood and there is a food pantry there that you're familiar with, you can take your donation directly to the pantry. It's turned around and distributed immediately from that perspective as well. It doesn't always have to come to the Utah Food Bank. We have 140 partner agencies that we utilize the services of across the state. All of them accept donations. Awesome. Now, what about volunteering here? If, like, you want to come volunteer, can somebody in the in Salt Lake or in the state of Utah come and volunteer? The three things that we ask for at the Utah Food Bank are food, time, and money. There you go. So the last um, few years as we've come through this horrible time, many of the people who are our donors became our recipients. They don't have cash to give back, but they do have time, so they'll volunteer, or perhaps they do have some food. So if you go to the webpage at utahfoodbank.org, the three icons are there. You can sign up for a 90-minute shift to volunteer. You can donate cash online. You can go to virtual food drive options, select the products on that virtual food drive you want to, to purchase. We'll use our buying power, your selection, and we'll do that for you. Awesome. Thank you so much, Jeanette, for uh, taking a few minutes and, and chatting with me and, and allowing us to uh, come here today. Well, you know, and thank you for selecting the Utah Food Bank. Thank you for the thousand uh, items that have been donated here and recognize the big difference that will make to a thousand people in the state of Utah. Absolutely. Thanks a lot, Jeanette. Thank you. Uh, after we were at Utah Food Bank, we sped off to uh, the road home right, at, uh, right in downtown Salt Lake City where we met up with the uh, good folks at Sugar House Barbecue. Uh, they prepared some delicious meals. They some delicious hot meals, some delicious hot barbecue uh, to help pass out uh, to the folks at the road home. It was really, really awesome to catch up with Celeste. I haven't seen her for a little while. Uh, she was on a recent episode of I Am Salt Lake, so she was, she was really surprised to see me. Uh, but I recorded a little bit of a conversation with her and uh, kind of find out a little bit more new stuff going on in, in some different things that she has going on. Again, uh, links for Road Home and, and all the folks that I've been talking to are at IamSaltLake.com slash 181. So yeah, here's the uh, conversation with uh, the folks at uh, Sugar House Barbecue and then Celeste uh, from the Road Home. All right, so we're at the uh, Road Home. I'm chatting with uh, Tyler from Sugar House Barbecue. And uh, first of all, why don't you tell us uh, tell us where you're located uh, for people listening? So the barbecue is located on the corner of 2100 South and 900 East. The exact address is 2100 South, 880 East. It's right across from uh, Smith's Marketplace. We're right in the heart of Sugar House. Uh, if you're driving on 2100 South, you can't miss us. Awesome, and uh, delicious barbecue, by the way. Uh, it's it's been a minute since I've been there, but uh, delicious barbecue. I highly recommend it. We're at the uh, road home, and uh, you guys made some delicious uh, food to uh, serve here tonight. Tell us, uh, tell actually, why don't you tell us what uh, what kind of food you've made up? Uh, so today we brought down some pulled pork, which is our number one seller at the barbecue. Uh, we also brought some of our really good smoked turkey breast, uh, really good sandwiches, and then side dish wise we have um, our cornbread, cucumber salad, macaroni and cheese. Um, and some coleslaw as well, so the good staples that we have at the barbecue. Awesome. Have you guys done anything like this here with the Road Home before or any, anything like this, or is this kind of a first endeavor? Yeah, with partnering with the Road Home, I think this might be one of our first ones that we've done, um, but we definitely do a lot of big events around Salt Lake. We just got done uh, catering for the Days of 47 Rodeo. We were down there all week. Uh, that, was, that was quite an event that we just, uh, Utah, had to happen. You know, Pioneer Days, got to love that one. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so we, we were slinging up barbecue down there all week as well. So, uh, you know, we try and get out in the community, you know, make, you know, get our presence out there. So it's good for business. Absolutely. One question, just for fun, Tyler, I want to ask, I always ask people usually that come on the show is, uh, say somebody was visiting Salt Lake for the first time. What is uh, like a building or an area of town or something that somebody has to go check out? Obviously, besides Sugar House Barbecue. Right. Besides the barbecue, um, one of the places I really like to take my family or friends when they come in is Inside Peak. It's a nice short be hike behind the Capitol, and then you get to see the whole city. Great pictures up there, especially in the evening time uh, when that sun sets. Sunsets are, sunsets are great up there. So I like showing people that. It gets them a good feel of everything around the city. Um, other than that, uh, you know, there's always the Temple Square is always the most popular, one of the most popular places to visit. A lot of history there. 
Um, and then, of course, my, my favorites are the ski resorts. That's why I'm here. You're a big skier? Uh, snowboarder, but yeah. Yeah, I moved here to snowboard. Uh, school's a plus, but snowboarding was definitely the main goal. Right on, man. And uh, you're on Sugar House Barbecues on Facebook, uh, yep. I would imagine. Any other, any other uh, outlets people can track you down? Uh, we're on Facebook and Instagram um, for sure. Okay. And, I'll, and I'll, I'll look for those links and put it at IamSaltLake.com uh, so people can check it out. I'll put the address, uh, Sugar House Barbecue. Go check them out. They're great uh, with their involvement with uh, CenturyLink in the road home. Love what you guys do. Thank you very much. You bet, Tyler. Thank you. So I'm at the uh, road home again, chatting with Celeste. It's been a it's been a little bit uh, since I was down here. Uh, I wish I re- would have remembered the episode number so I could. But I'll, I'll I'll put that with the show notes for this one when I chatted with Celeste about the road home. I'm here again with uh, CenturyLink and uh, helping out with the good deeds around Salt Lake. We ended the day here at the road home. How are you doing, Celeste? I'm great. I'm so excited. Yeah. This is great to have Century Link here and Sugar House Barbecue. Um, our clients are really excited for the meal tonight, so I'm just happy to be a part of it. Awesome. Now, remind uh, listeners that might not have listened to the episode I did with you, The Road Home. You know, people here in Salt Lake, we see it. It's uh, right by the gateway. What is the road home doing for uh, the Salt Lake community? Well, we are the largest homeless shelter in Utah. So we serve single men, single women, and families with children. And we really do um, several areas of focus. The first is that emergency services piece, getting everybody in off the street, providing them emergency shelter, getting basic necessities like food and clothing. Um, From there, we have a team of case managers who work side by side with our families and some of our single men and women population. And they really try to get our clients connected to community resources things like employment and schooling and vocational training and then finally our third and our largest focus is housing Um, we have a housing first philosophy here which means basically we believe anything clients can do in shelter they can do it in housing and it's better for them so get them into housing as quickly as you can and then you can address the issues that led to homelessness in the first place so we serve about 7,000 people annually um, through our agency you guys are doing a heck of a job. Well, thank you. And I know I said it the last time, you know, when we sat down and chatted, but you, you definitely are, and I appreciate it. Let's actually chat as well. Uh, we brought it up when, when we were recording with CenturyLink, uh, but Governor Herbert's uh, initiative with the with the homeless families. Yes. Talk a little bit about that. Uh, I wasn't really too aware of, of what he has going on. Uh, before we recorded with you, but why don't you uh, share with the listeners a little bit what's going on with that? Well, the state of Utah has been working directly with homeless service providers, including the Road Home, for over the past decade. And there have been several initiatives. There was an initiative to um, to get chronically homeless vets housed. Um, we also had an initiative to end chronic homelessness. And now we're focusing on families. And that is a really important uh, population to serve. Just at the road home from 2010 to the present, we've experienced a 50% increase in the number of families coming to us. So we're seeing the number of families growing and that is very alarming and so to put a spotlight on that population I think is incredibly important and we're thrilled that Governor Herbert and the state of Utah are focusing on that that group of the homeless population. Absolutely and uh, thank you Governor Herbert. Reminder for listeners how they can get involved, how they can volunteer or donate uh, to the road home. There's lots of ways to get involved at the Road Home. Um, Donations are great. Monetary donations, I have to say that. I'm the development director. As little as $10 moves one person off the street and into the shelter for one night. You can go to our website, which is theroadhome.org, and make a donation. Um, We also accept in-kind donations, and that's another really vital source for us. So we need things like um, clothing, pots and pans, dishes, uh, hygiene items. So if you have items like that, bring them down. The shelter, we're open 365 days a year, 24 hours a day. So you can come by anytime, any day, and drop off your donations. And then finally, um, volunteers are a tremendous support to us. Last year, we had over 13,000 volunteers. We have weekly opportunities as well as one-time opportunities. Again, visit our website. It has all the opportunities listed. It's theroadhome.org. Excellent. I'll put those at uh, imsaltlake.com. Uh, if you didn't have a chance to write that down, thank you again, Celeste, and the road home. And I'll put the link, you know, when we chatted, because I know we Great. chatted for, it was about an hour, you know. It was, it good, was a long it time. Was, it, it was, was a good, really it was fun. A, it was a great conversation that I, I had. I had a great time. Well, that was, it was a few months ago. Yeah, so, yeah I think yeah, it was. Yeah, so anyway, thank you so much, oh, Celeste. Oh, thank you. You bet. 
All right, this next uh, next conversation is is a snippet, is is a, a chance that I had to uh, talk to Governor Herbert, the governor of Utah here, and uh, ask him a couple questions, shake his hand. It was really cool. Never in the three years of doing this podcast did I, I even imagine in my wildest dreams that I would be able to uh, talk to the governor of Utah and uh, the folks at Century Lincoln and partnering up with them. Uh, gave me that opportunity, so I'm. I was really stoked on that. So the the quality, the sound there there was a there was a weird squeal somewhere. I'm not really sure where that came from, so I apologize. But I felt like uh, this this was definitely needed to share on this episode. So yeah, here enjoy it. Uh, here's uh, my chance to uh, talk to uh, Governor uh, Herbert. How you doing, Governor? Good. How are you? Chris Hollifield from I Am Salt Lake podcast on behalf of CenturyLink. Just wanted to. Uh, ask you how the recent uh, Here for Good movement, uh, CenturyLink's uh, had here in town the last couple of days, how that's impacted Salt Lake City. Well, I like the slogan, Here for Good, and we hope CenturyLink is here for good, not only permanently for good, but uh, in their contributions. Uh, you know, we have a hard time being successful a state without corporate stepping up and saying we have something to do and we have something to contribute. And we encourage our employees to contribute. Well, that's what CenturyLink is doing. And they're a big part of our fabric and a great corporate citizen and are leading by example. And I expect that other corporations will take this as a challenge and maybe step forward and help uh, with food bank and other opportunities that are here in, here in the state to be good corporate citizens and give back and get their employees to, to step up and volunteer and give back too. So uh, congratulations to CenturyLink. This is really a great uh, example of what they are doing and that they are here for good. Absolutely. Thank Thanks, you. Governor. Thank you. Appreciate it.